All right. Thank you so much. Um, so functional infrastructure, um, this is the name that we give to, to, to building, automation, automating the infrastructures in a functional way. So what is infrastructure automation? Um, basically, the concept is just to write programs that will um, build and operate infrastructure in a programmatic way. Um, why do people do that? Um, for once, um, people need to increase reliability of their operations. Um, if a systems go down, they wanna rebuild them quickly, and they don't wanna have a, a bunch of ops guys uh, on call just in, in case things fall apart. So they wanna have a programmatic way of building infrastructure. Um, there's a second secondary reason that it's more prevalent now um, about infrastructure automation is, is that People automate their infrastructure because they getting the infrastructure is getting complex and hard to understand or build uh, for one person. So they want to manage complexity. Where does the complexity come from? Um, so when we talk about infrastructure, um, a lot of the people think about production. Uh, and in production, things are relatively simple in the sense that there's one design of the, of the system that gets implemented, and then there's a, there's a lot of work in keeping the state of the system alive, but, but the design is sort of static over time. Uh, but as we move, ba move backwards into development, what we find is that there's no one infrastructure, there's many infrastructures that are, lives in different moments in time. So a, a, a development team may be working on a new version of the, of the system in which it uses a complete new database. Or, or it's the same database, but it's a different type of configuration, so on and so forth. So what, what goes on here is that the, the design of the infrastructure is actually very dynamic, and there's multiple versions of, of this infrastructure. Also happens that we don't, in, in development, we don't test in production class servers. Um, sometimes we use virtualized environments, sometimes we use uh, containers, um, or we use the cloud, or the or production uses the cloud and we use virtual machines. So we want the same infrastructure to be able to be spawn and operated on different underlying infrastructure. Um, there's also a lot of um, distributed software that gets configured in, in the forms of clusters or sometimes hot standby of replica sets. And, and that creates another source of complexity because you're not now bugging one server at a time you actually have to think about what happens when you add or remove a server in a system from the whole system perspective. And, and, and the, the worst probably case of uh, complexity is that we're actually automating operating systems that were not designed to be automated. Um, they were uh, designed to be uh, automate other tasks and they were designed to, designed to automate themselves but definitely not designed for an external agent to automate them. So these all create a big ball of complexity. Um, the reason why I'm talking about this is because we started three years ago, over three years ago now, um, uh, Palette, which is a, a infrastructure automation platform that is built on Clojure, which is a list that, that, that runs on the JVM. And it's now, the core is now over 30,000 K lines of code. Um, and, and we wanted to solve this complexity problem because we, we wanted to automate infrastructure and the current tools didn't quite cut it. Also, as a design constraint uh, that informs a lot of a lot of the features in Palette is that it had to work in today's infrastructure. So it's not like a you know beginning with a clean slate uh, project. Um, and we also wanted to work everywhere. We wanted to work on the cloud, virtual box, um, straight hardware. And finally, we wanted to, for users of this platform to be able to code to extend it and to embed it in their code. So. The, what we did to manage complexity, I don't think this is news to anyone in this room. Um, what we did is first create abstractions to, to remove the details, uh, the pesky details of the underlying platform. That allows us to then create components at a high level of abstraction that will work on the previous components will be reusable across infrastructures. Um, to make our lives easier, we decided to, to uh, work on a stateless mode. So our palette has no state. Um, there's no database anywhere. There's no variables saved anywhere. So every time you run Polyt, you start from scratch. You create a new state, and when the session ends, you're done. And and that allows us to to write all the code inside Polyt in a purely functional style. So each each the results of every function is is 
is a function of the input, and that's, that's it. That means testing is easy, uh, developing is relatively easy. And finally, uh, to make it less complex to the user, instead of building a service, we built a library. And I'll show how, for the, for the end user, this is just like a jar file that you import in your, in your project and you use it. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is in this stack of, of abstractions. Um, and I'm going to show a ton of code, so I hope you didn't need too much. Uh, so at the bottom of, of this stack, and this is the closest to the, to the, the servers, it's a, it's a script DSL, we call it Stevedore. Um, and basically this will transform closure code uh, into shell scripts. Now, the way this is done is that the shell script is, is uh, target dependent. So if you're targeting different uh, centers, the shell script may be different than the shell script targeting OS X. Right? So this is the smallest example I could find. Uh, this is a more interesting example. Um, in which we're inter intertwining uh, Stevedore code, so everything that's inside exec script is a, it's Stevedore, with closure code on the outside. So on the outside, we're just declaring uh, files to be a set of uh, file names, and then inside, we use the unquote to refer to closure code. So the unquote can actually call functions. You can put any closure code inside the script, and then what this ends up generating, the result of compiling this is a, is a shell script that will be run on, on the node itself. So the underpinnings of Palette. Uh, all, all of Palette is built on these abstractions um, of the script. So on top of this, we have the script library, which is just a way to define um, common actions at the operating level. And this uses uh, uh, multi-methods, so you can system hierarchy and you can say well you know for for all the all the Linux out there this is how you get the home user uh, for example on Ubuntu you, do, you use get end but then you can say for all the family of OS X all the Darwin family actually the implementation is different because the OS is completely different in this regard so so these script libraries this uh, for example user home you can use it inside of your script DSL so you're constantly building um, scripts that are farther and farther away from the actual uh, operating system. Then, at a higher level of abstractions, we have actions, and actions are things that you do uh, on the server. Um, and actions are discrete, and an action can be a script, an action can be a set of actions that, that eventually end up being scripts, and I'll show a little of this. And again, uh, actions use what we call a version dispatch, um, which means that it's a multi-method, but this multi-method dispatches on the OS family and the OS version. Uh, and it's open for extensibility. So if we have an action, this is, for example, creating the user, that it's pretty much the same between Ubuntu and CentOS, but it changes slightly. If tomorrow CentOS changes this syntax again, you can actually just declare the method uh, for this type of OS and will override the, the defaults in Palette. So you can extend Palette to support OSs that we haven't thought of. Um, all right, so now we're switching gears and we're going to uh, uh, another level up, which is the plan. So a plan is an abstract, it's, it's a sequence of actions that are gonna be run to achieve a, concrete, a concrete result. Um, there's a bunch of code here, but just know that what we do here is at the top, we're just importing what we call a create library. So a create is just a bunch of plans that relate to configuring a particular service. And, and then we're just calling install on, on this plan. So this is the, how you install Java on the machine. Inside the create, there's this code like this, in which is, we call it a dev plan, and it just lists a set of, a set of actions, a sequence of actions. Running this plan node, Running this plan results in a data structure that has an abstract representation of the actions to be run. And, and those actions, they, they don't have a script representation yet. So once later on when we want to execute this plan, that's when those actions inside the plan get converted into actual shell scripts. So plans are very high level and they're guaranteed to work across platforms. Um, Palette uh, plans creates a plan before executing it. You can actually interrogate Palette and say, why would you, how would you install Java on, I think this is Ubuntu, 
right? And and what I'll print out is is in this case there's two actions. Um, one is is the one that will install the package files on the system, and it'll. If you know anything about Ubuntu, this is this is the code to, to set up the package manager to some to use some repository, and then call the package manager to install. And then the second action has to do with setting up the, the local environment on the machine so that when you log in, you get the right Java version right away, right? But again, this is a much lower level of abstraction from this. This is very, this gets converted to this at the end of the day. So you can interrogate Pilot and say, hey, what would you do if, if we call this function? On top of that, then, we have abstractions that deal with how you set up systems that get closer to your domain. Um, and these abstractions, uh, I'm showing two of them, there's more. Um, there's node spec, um, and node spec defines in an abstract way what type of hardware and operating system you want to run this system on. So if you're talking to the cloud and you say, hey, I want to build this web server and I want to use an Ubuntu with uh, two CPUs and 64 gigs of RAM, and cloud providers will use different ways of obtaining. Um, so this works across cloud providers. And underneath is the group spec. And the group spec is just a set of functions um, uh, organizing what we call phases. Um, that, that are related uh, with a service. So for example, this is a group spec that sets up a web server. And, and this group spec has a, a phase called configure. This configure phase will install Java and will install Tomcat, right? This is pretty simple. Uh, you can have more phases. One could be a restart the, the web server. The other one can be install an application in this web server, so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, these, these ends up being just call to plan functions. Um, and, and again, they'll turn into shell scripts later on. Once you have defined your, your, uh, your configuration, then you call Pilot and you tell, hey, build five of these servers um, and build them on, on Amazon EC2. And that's all you need to do, right? So you can pass these to your users. But this is when it gets interesting because at, at this point, we're just dealing with closure code, right? So what what I'm doing here, this is pretty much the same thing we had before. It's just that now the configuration that we want to create is created functionally, right? So, so we're not defining how our servers are going to look like. We're defining a function that will define how the servers are going to be created like. This is where you start uh, putting in the domain of, of your application. Right, so now you, instead of having web servers, you can say, well, I got the, the UI server, which is like a web server, but it installs the UI application. Or I have the production uh, UI server, which is, is just like the development one, but a bigger machine. Um, or you can combine these, these specs into, into, like combining the database uh, spec and the, and the web server spec into one single machine, or have them separated or replicated. But at the end of the day, what we wanted to achieve, and this is what it does, is that now we're, we're just dealing with regular libraries and like regular closure code. There's no Mac, there's no weirdness here, which is calling these functions. For example, um, this is something that we could do in QA. Uh, I don't expect you guys to follow this code, but what this code does is using the functions we created before, which create web servers dynamically, we, we want to spawn this web server on CentOS 6.3, Ubuntu 10.4, and Red Hat 7, right? So we just create a function that will create a data structure that represents what we want to do, and then feed it into Pilot and say, build these servers on Amazon EC2 or build these servers on VirtualBox, the code will remain the same, right? And this stuff can be distributed in the, on the, uh, across the company as a JAR file that gets put in your JAR repo, right? So other Java libraries can just download this JAR and use it right away. <coughs> Finally, um, and this is just an example, um, using those higher level abstractions of the specs, what our users are doing is build the logic to build more complex systems on top of it. So here, for example, 
is how you build a Cassandra cluster using Palette and a, and a Cassandra library. Um, you just you just call this library and you say, hey, build this cluster on this hardware to 12 uh, CPU, 64 gigs of RAM, and this is the same spec as the Cassandra server spec, so, so we're not changing defaults of configuration here. And then underneath we're saying, um, create six nodes of Cassandra on Amazon EC2, or create three nodes of Cassandra on VirtualBox, or create them in your own hardware uh, application. All right, so how does Palette work internally? Um, I mentioned before the, that we were pl creating plans and then executing them. So when you call Palette, you, you actually say, not only call Palette, you actually uh, list a set of phases you wanna run. Um, for example, one would be install the software, then another phase would be configure the software, uh, another phase could be start the, the servers. Um, for each phase, each phase is synchronous. So each phase executes on all the nodes in parallel and waits for all the nodes to be finished and then it collects all the information and starts the next phase, right? So for each phase, there's a plan, there's, a, there's the creation of the plan, which we call lift, that grabs the current, si the current state of the system and, you, and the functions that you invoke. And for each node, it will create a plan and for each plan, it will generate the scripts for that node. So you can have a plan that spawns CentOS uh, on, on, on the cloud and Ubuntu on VirtualBox in one system. You could do something like that. Um, so when it creates the, the, the actual shell scripts, it only takes into account that, that node. And then the second part of the plan is the execution. So then it goes and executes the scripts um, on the nodes and gets the results back. And once it's done with this, then and all the nodes are finished, it goes back to the, the, to the plan for the next uh, phase. Why, why, I'm, why is this important? Because for one thing is to build a cluster, the other one is to operate it. So when you're operating a cluster, um, sometimes you have to gather information from the cluster itself to make decisions about how you're gonna operate it. For example, uh, in Cassandra, um, which is a distributed database, sometimes it happens that the database uh, gets unbalanced. So some nodes in the Cassandra cluster may have way more keys than some other nodes that are, are starving for keys and that creates a performance issue. How do you rebalance? Well, you ask each of the nodes how many keys they have and then you decide how to spread the keys, re-spread the keys um, across the nodes. So for this, we would use two phases, one in which we would interrogate the cluster itself about its own state and then the second phase in which we use that information to generate a new set of keys and then push those keys on the nodes. One final note uh, about the internal uh, implementation of Palet is that over time we shifted a lot from using functions to just using data. Uh, we found that data to be the ultimate uh, API that it, it's very easy to create a representation of the clarity of the representation of what you intend to do and delay the, the conversion of that data into actual functions as far further down in time as we can. Because this allows us to, to actually do optimizations on our plans uh, way before we actually generating the scripts. So for example, if you have many functions that create users, Palette will will reorganize the plan so that all the users are created in one step um, as an optimization. But also data, is, it's much easier to test and verify than, than functions. So where are we now? Um, we have a functional infrastructure automation um, that works on most of the cloud environments and straight hardware and virtual um, machines. Um, we're building complex and flexible clusters, things that are very dynamic in nature. Um, uh, it's easy as we wanted to build abstractions on top of it and we have a lot of users doing that. Um, and as a final note, sometimes we wish we had static typing. Um, using closure with no static typing is, is a lot of fun until it stops being fun. And then it's like, ah, I wish <laughs> we had put typing in it. Um, so that's pretty much it.
Right. Well, basically, it, er error handling de depends on how you call the script. That's the way we solved it. So the script will return um, a one or a zero. Um, we don't know where on the script the error happened. What we've done is actually, the, I didn't show it here, the generated script has, um, is annotated with the, the, line, the file on the line in the file of the code that, that generated that script, right? So, so the way we do it now is like if you have a script and it fails, you just have to look where it failed, look at the comment and, t and try to link it back to the file that, that created it, right? So you can see that. Um, in terms of the exit code, then you can capture it and, and raise it as an exception. Oh, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, I understand. No, you can actually, again, it's the, the way you can chain the, the, the scripts in an AND, and the first one to fail will, will escape, or not, and you can say, I don't care, and then it'll do exactly what you say, just follow through. So depending on how you call, there's, there's different actions, like there's a run check script, which will check for errors at each step, or just run script, which will won't care about the errors and just run them. But you have to know what you're doing yeah, at the end of the day. Yeah, there's no escaping that. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you.